how does Murakami Takashi build his empire? In this episode, let's find out! Hello everyone, welcome back to Visual Literacy Hub, this is Angela. I created this channel to record my daily observation and analysis about this very visual world that we live in. My analysis is 100% personal, nothing professional. This is about you and I together to see, think and share. Well, let the fun begin! Murakami Takashi is a controversial contemporary artist. And much of the controversy comes from the fact that he is a rich artist who often shows up in fashion shows, product launch and events of trendy brands, not in some kind of quiet, messy art studio that most people visualize artists to be in. He's an artist who treats art as a business and branding. He even built his own company and hired more than 300 staff to mass produce his artworks for him. And then he just signed his name and sell them to the market. Murakami explores how the creation of art can be seen as commercial and assembly line like process involving many makers. It sounds like he's grew from Despicable Me, who is surrounded by his enslaved minions, right? But before we judge him, let's first have a look at how he has collaborated with brands to make money. In his collaborative interview with Virgil, when asked, why do you think you've been so fearless of playing with fashion? Murakami said that, I'm an outsider. I'm Japanese. I don't feel obliged to play by the rules, which isn't say, I don't know them. The other reason is because there is an audience in art, but in fashion, there's another set of eyes. And they found my collaboration and looked up what else I was creating. When asked, how do you anticipate that the creations you two have done together will integrate themselves into the art world? Milakami said, we have great supporters in young kids. They've already bought something from him and something from me. At the same time, they're interested to see how this comes into contemporary art. These guys have fast desires. They want to buy something and keep it in their collection. Virgil also offered great insight by saying, there's obviously an evolution of education. The biggest education device in art is fashion, fashionable things. It's one of those blurry lines that lends a space for people to create. Young kids are in our legion, in our community, are going to see things in different medium than typically expected. Clearly, when some other people are criticizing and complaining, Virgil and Murakami are already recruiting and educating the future buyers of art, the young generation who love new, fashionable things, and who are happy to pay a lot for this new form of art. After all, the right to define or redefine art is held in the hands of living people, people of the future. Many of you might have heard about Murakami's art production company, Kai Kai Kiki, where he hired about 300 people who must be under 30 when they apply, which is interesting, to produce his artworks. But through the company, Murakami also helped many young artists to gain international exposure by exhibitions, by producing and selling merchandise, and by organizing art festivals and conventions. Many artists associated with the group show overlap between their ideas and Murakami's by making reference to manga or anime. For example, you can see elements of super flatness from the works of artists like Aya Takano, Lei Sato, Mahomi Kunikata, and Obi. Murakami is also very consistent about his philosophy that art needs to sell, and he passes this philosophy to his mentees by encouraging them to take a commercialized approach to the production of their art. As the Kaikai Kiki studio expands, more like-minded artists continue to join, 
And this model of learning from a well-established artist like Murakami, who has the skill, the connection, the fame, and the money, really drives these artists on a fast lane and nurtures Murakami's super flat art movement. In my opinion, this is a very smart plan. By expanding the influence of a form of art and his own philosophy, Murakami has a wing-wing-wing-wing situation for himself, his mentees, the global impact of Japanese contemporary art, and the market. Art takes money and time. Yan Murakami had a deep understanding of what that means. And that's why he trained himself to understand the rules of the art market. And he even wrote a book called Art Entrepreneurship Theory, which explains exactly why he combined business and art and how he did it. Since this book is not available in English, I've quoted Kai Itoi's analysis, which the link is in the description, and added some of my own thoughts to it. Rule number one, play by the Western rule. According to Murakami, the Japanese art world is so incredibly backward that if you want to be a professional artist, you must forget about the country's art establishment and break into the Western art market. To do that though, you must be armed with a good business strategy. He wrote that, in order to stand up to the Western artist, I analyzed the mechanism of Western art. I also polished my skills in creative management, making hypotheses and testing them. Many of you may ask, but why do we must follow the rules of the West when every country and civilization has their own arts? In my opinion, any kind of visual or art or cultural form, no matter how beautiful or unique it is, if it does not have a wide range of audience and followers, it will die sooner or later in the flood of time. And when you can only find them in history books, how well can you appreciate it? Anyone who wants his or her art to be recognized and remembered has to acknowledge that Western art is still dominant in the market. And only by playing the existing rules and putting one foot in first, one could then bring his or her own form of art to challenge the norm. Just like how Murakami challenged traditional art through Japanese subculture, collaborating with Western brands. When more artists who share his idea follow, it forms a momentum of new art and challenges the traditional definition of art, which then educates the young generation of their own art definition and form. Rule number two. Art should be commercial. In his book, Murakami repeatedly complained that Japanese artists don't understand that art making is and should be a commercial activity. In the post-war democracy, everybody became equal, or at least that was the illusion for a long time. 90% of the Japanese considered themselves middle class. Murakami writes that after the war, it was decided that art should be something everybody can equally appreciate, and it was a mistake. In the West, art isn't for everybody. Art is an extremely expensive hobby. And Japan failed to create an art market for the wealthy. Murakami's idea reminds me to think of the hierarchical attributes of art. First of all, let's acknowledge that the most people who are willing to invest in art are wealthy people. In countries like the United States, people who are successful feel peer pressure to contribute to the society. And one of the popular ways is to purchase fine works of art and donate them to the museum, which the amount of the work donated will also be tax deductible. Which now you see why art is a popular business in the upper class. This means that while art can indeed be appreciated by all for free, it is always accompanied by trade. And once there's trading, there's hierarchy. And let's also not forget that most of us no longer control what we perceive as beautiful. In today's society, social media, celebrity, big brands, marketing companies, all these things and people define what is beautiful and what is not. This means art is never purely for appreciation. It can serve as information, sometimes a manipulative one. Sometimes it serves a certain political and societal mission. Sometimes it was designed to educate an idea to the public. Sometimes it's a tool to show off or for investment. And sometimes it is a pure act to avoid tax. So for those art that can satisfy these various needs, 
Can we exclude them from the definition of pure art? I don't think so. Because there's hardly any pure art after all. That's all I want to share with you in this episode. Thank you for watching. Do you agree with Murakami's philosophy? As a consumer, do you find his work worthy of your attention and money? If you work within the field of creativity, what do you think about his approach? Leave me a comment below. Like this video and subscribe if you find it helpful or inspired some critical thinking in you. See you next Wednesday. Bye!